Happy holidays and happy celebrations to our Muslim brothers and sisters around the world. Good morning and welcome to Breakfast Central. Thank you very much for joining us. There's no solar eclipse to be seen here in Nigeria, <laughs> but what we can do is share with you some of the biggest stories happening across the country. I am Olive Emodi. And I'm Johansson, welcoming you to another day here on Breakfast Central. We're broadcasting live from Lagos, Nigeria. So if you're tuning in, well, do feel free to, um, you know, tweet us or X us. <laughs> yeah, very careful with that. And let us know what you think about the stories that we will be bringing to you this morning. So many things are happening in the FCT. That's the Federal Capital Territory in Abuja. Uh, the FCT minister has closed down the ICC, uh, that's the center, uh, to ensure that there are you know, repairs here and there. Besides that, there are conversations concerning the impeachment of Philip Scheibel, mm -hmm. which seems uh, to be hogging the headlines uh, from yesterday up until now. I mean, it's not something yeah. that we're surprised to yeah. see. It was already something it was, it was that coming. many people could predict. If 24 of the House, uh, Assembly, uh, House of Assembly members already signed the petition, it was almost a no-brainer that he was going to be impeached. Mm -hmm. But what some people did say was he should have given himself some regard by resigning before the re impeachment actually happened. But that's something that we'll go into much later today. Uh, we're also going to be looking at uh, the big story regarding Julius Abure. But I want to talk about the solar <laughs> eclipse. I don't know if you saw it on social media. Yeah. It was very interesting to watch the concept of the weather switching from daylight to nighttime in a few minutes. It was pitch black and then back to the daytime. And I saw videos of people who were crying, videos of people who were shaking, thinking, my goodness, this is Joe. <laughs> when we start talking about emotional things like this, Joe will give me the same. No, no, I'm like, like, the, the same people who are crying and shaking will be the same ones who will say, nah, there's no God, you know what I mean? Yeah, some of them were then saying, oh, yes. Indeed, there is God. Mm -hmm. Can nobody? There's a lady that her commentary was really finishing me on social media. It was beautiful. But I feel like that would be me when I finally see the Northern Lights. Uh, that, that's my dream come true. I'll cry. Did you see the last eclipse that happened here in Nigeria many years yeah, ago? Yeah, I did. I, I, did. I was actually outside. I remember that. We, we had to. Uh, some guys made, made Glasses. money. Glasses. Yes, yes. Some guys made money off, off a lot of us on the streets. Like, eclipse, eclipse, eclipse. Like, eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> Let's find out if Darshan was also a part of the last eclipse. Hello, Darshan. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Uh, yes, yeah, so talking about the Northern Lights, um, Olive, fantastic idea. I, I really cannot wait to see that as well. I'm sure that's when I'll cry. But I've seen so many eclipses. I don't know. You sound yeah. like you haven't seen any. Yeah. I remember the first one was when I was in JS1. That was the first time I actually yes. saw it. And mm -hmm. I was so sleepy, but I had to, you know, keep my eyes open. And it was yeah, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. It happened at night, by the way. It happened that it was totally dark. You couldn't see the next person standing beside you. So but it was quite an interesting phenomenon. Interesting. And I saw the last one as well. Yeah. I remember where I was when the last one happened as well. I was a teacher at the time, if I remember correctly, and I brought out a number of my students, and we put out, it was very interesting, we put out a bowl of water because they couldn't look directly at the sun, and I wanted them to be able to see it. So I put out a bowl of water and had them look at the reflection of the sun through mm. the water. Mm. Mm. <laughs> very interesting. interesting. Dasha, what do you make of um, the Edo state uh, crisis? Uh, I mean, Philip Shaw is out right now. Uh, Joe? It's been a long time coming. Uh, you know, I did speak to somebody uh, yesterday, a legal practitioner yesterday, who said uh, Shaibu actually had so many opportunities to come out, defend himself. Like, they actually gave him that honor. But, you know, uh, he was egotistic and, you know, he felt like nothing could actually touch him. And then this happened. And it's funny how it actually happened in the blink of an eye. You know, he was replaced immediately, just like, you know, uh, Yem, uh, what do you call Yemi Cardoso replaced uh, some of the directors and assistant directors so uh, it, it's quite funny it's a long time coming you know I don't think it has actually shaken the political dynamics of Edo State you know everything goes on everything moves on the way it was even though he came out with a dis with a with a, what do you call it he came out to sorry yeah. He yeah, thinks yeah. he was um, illegally removed, that it was an, an undemocratic process. He thinks that yeah, he his right to yes. freedom of running as Vying running for, for justice governor. and all that. Yeah. But I don't think anything is going to happen. I really don't think so. Well, well if they've written is. to the Supreme Court, the solicitors, let, let's see what will come out of that as well. But so many stories to talk about 
Uh, Dashing will come back to you for the uh, breakfast headlines. Let's first of all um, introduce our top stories, especially to our viewers who are joining us from home this morning. This morning on Breakfast Central, court remands Emifiele in EFCC custody, so he's back until April 11th. Edo Assembly impeaches Philip Shaibu as Deputy Governor, and that's the video where he's talked about how this is such an illegal process and uh, against his rights. Uh, uh, protesters set for showdown with NLC. On, uh, on Abu's mandate, they will stand. Kaduna abducted worshippers regain freedom. That's a good story. Good story. And then, of course, we do have the uh, newspaper front pages. So stay with us. Uh, Dash it brings to us uh, breakfast headlines. Hello and welcome to Breakfast Headlines. I'm Darshan Usman. And let's begin by telling you that Edo State Governor Godwin Obasaki has sworn in Omobaya Godwins as the new Deputy Governor of the state. Omobaya replaced Philip Shaibu, who was earlier impeached by the State House of Assembly on Monday morning. Shaibu was impeached by the House of Assembly after the adoption of the report of Justice S.A. Omonua retired led impeachment panel. The panel was set up by the chief judge of Edo State to investigate allegations of misconduct and perjury against Shaibu. Now, 18 out of the 20 lawmakers that attended the plenary on Monday voted in favor of the impeachment while one voted against it. Meanwhile, the former Deputy Governor Shaibu has reacted to his impeachment by the House. The Governor of Central Bank of Nigeria, Yemi Cardoso, has sacked a fresh batch of 40 staff, mostly from the Development Finance Department, in furtherance of its ongoing restructuring. Deputy Directors and Assistant Directors were mostly affected with 22 from the Development Finance Department and the remaining 18 from the Medicals and Procurement Services Department. Now, amongst those affected were eight directors, 10 deputy directors, five assistant directors, two principal managers, and two senior managers. With the latest number of affected staff, the total has now reached 67. Recall that not less than 27 members of staff, most of them directors of the Central Bank of Nigeria, were affected by the first batch of dismissals. A Lagos State Special Offences Court has ordered the remand of former Central Bank of Nigeria Governor Godwin Emefiele to the custody of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission on the charges of abuse of office. Justice Rahman Oshodi issued the remand order following Emefiele's arraignment alongside his co-defendant, Harry Omoile, on a 26-count charge related to abuse of office. Now, during the proceedings, Emefiele's lawyer, Abdul Hakim Ladi Lawal, sought bail for his client on self-recognition or the most lenient terms possible. He urged the court to consider granting bail based on similar terms previously approved by another court. Human rights lawyer Femi Falano says the federal government, through the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission, plans to extend electricity tariff hike beyond Band A consumers to other Nigerians categorized under other bands. Falano said the recent tariff increase for Band A consumers by the government cannot be justified under the Electricity Act 2023. He threatened to approach the courts to seek redress for Nigerians. The senior advocate of Nigeria argued that the federal government had already removed electricity subsidy in 2022 and so the government, by the new tariff hike, is making Nigerians pay for the inefficiency and profligacy of those managing the electricity sector. And that's all on the Breakfast Headlines. It's now back to Joe and Olive. Thank you so much, Dashin. Um, so many stories, especially the CBN governor, um, we just talked about that uh, quite a uh, few minutes ago. And then again, um, that big story of uh, uh, marvelous Godwins, uh, who was immediately uh, appointed as soon as the immediate past uh, deputy governor was indeed, um, you know, uh, let go. I don't want to use the word. It, it feels awkward when you just say, oh, you know what, he was impeached. But he is impeached. Well, he I agree, impeached. I agree, I agree. Impeached. Don't get me wrong, but it's kind of like... 
was really fast, you know. He wasn't even given a chance. He to was. Say. All right, okay, okay. He was. He, he was sacked. He didn't show up. He was sacked. He was impeached, <laughs> which is completely different sacked. from him being removed. Sacked. I, but I like it's just that unfortunate that, but, because I think, if, I mean, I stand to be correct, but I think that he loses certain privileges that would have been he would have been entitled to if, if his tenure, tenure just yeah, ran out. Yeah, so yeah. Mm -hmm. just like with governors who still have privileges even whilst they're not in office, he loses all of that. I remember he actually lost out on all fronts. Remember he actually contested for, you know, uh, governor, as he was a governorship candidate during the primaries and all that. He lost and now he's no longer the uh, deputy governor. And so many people have actually been asking, why did this have to happen, you know, at this time of their tenure when it's almost over? Do you know why? <laughs> Um, I may be wrong, but I think in a way, one, to humble <laughs> Shaibo and let him know that he's not above his principal and his party. Mm. Two, because at this point, it's already too late for anything to happen. Mm. He can't go to the APC. He can't go to the Labour Party. These parties have already done their primaries. They already have their flagship uh, candidates for the gubernatorial elections. So he cannot run for office in this coming election. That ship has sailed. So in other words, he has it's all over. So he has been he has been own. he has been thrown into political redundancy. retirement yes and, and 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 i shudder to think about what this will mean for his career mm. beyond now he was he had a lot of promise he was such a shining light yeah but i don't know what this will mean for his career going forward but as a comrade let's see if um he would uh, come up with um anything aside from the fact that they're going to the supreme court uh, the Apex Court. I don't know how um, I, I don't the know. Final anyway. say. But then again, thank you so much, Dashin. Uh, we look thank forward you to seeing you again at nine. By the way, you're looking dashing. Thank you. You're looking handsome as well. Make Two of you are dry. Why are you guys trying is to be anybody here? Why are you both trying to be like oh, me? Dry oh, jokes is oh, my thing. I no, only what's so your thing? I'm, I'm the queen I'm of so dry sorry. jokes. I'm, I'm the queen so of dry I'm jokes. I'm so sorry. Anyway, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll continue. We'll later. go for a break. When we come back, our top stories, okay? Members of the United Church of Christ in Nigeria, located in the Kaura local government of Kaduna State, abducted during a wedding ceremony almost three months ago, have regained their freedom. The church not, uh, members who were kidnapped from the church premises on the 23rd of December 2023 have been released by the kidnappers. Our reporter, Marvelous Obomanu, reports. Kaduna State has been on the news recently owing to the abduction of school children in Kuriga, which has continued to raise questions over the level of insecurity in the state. On the 23rd of December 2023, over 50 members of the Hekan Church, Kara local government area of the state, were kidnapped by armed bandits within the church premises while attending a wedding reception. After three months of waiting, the victims finally regained their freedom Though one died in the hands of the kidnappers. The president of the church, Emos Kiri, while celebrating the release of the church members at the Hekan headquarters in Kaduna, described the activities of armed bandits, especially in Nigeria's northern region, as a tragic and sorry situation. They have taken about 50, over 50 of our members, even though some of them escaped. But uh, we have lost one instantly during the issue of kidnap. Then he was shot dead. We have also lost another one at the process when they were released and they were coming. The other one died. And so many have suffered degree of uh, injuries and it has affected them. Nigeria that is supposed to be one of the greatest nations in the world is today struggling people cannot go to sleep people cannot do their businesses uh, in peace farmers have to desert their farms which perpetuates and increases hunger he urged president bola tinibu to provide modern day security equipment to help security agencies tackle insecurity in the country a lot needs to be done the security men and women all the security apparatus in this country need to synergize if we must overcome this monster. I plead with them to put aside competition. 
let them work together in order to salvage this country. The clerics frowned at some religious leaders who preach and promote violence in the name of religion and called on citizens to join the war against insecurity. In Abuja for News Central, Marvelous Obama. Good reports there by Marvelous Obama, and of course, uh, worthy of celebration to have them back. Sadly, uh, one actually died in the process. Very, very sad. But you know what? We'll come back to that story. Let's move on to a very, very uh, important story next. And this time, we're taking you to uh, a very important discussion. We'll tell you that following his arraignment for alleged abuse of office and allocation of $4.5 billion and also $2.8 billion naira, the Lagos High Court in Ikeja yesterday ordered the remand of embattled former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, Godwin Emefiele, in the care of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. Emefiele entered a not guilty plea to the allegations against him, as did his co-defendant, Harry Omoli, who was charged on 26 new counts before Justice Rahman Oshodi. A. Labola Wal, the defendant's attorney, begged the judge to grant him a filly bill in self-recognizance so he can continue with the bill that the Abuja court had previously granted him. He also asked the court to award the second defendant the bill that Justice Osule Hamzat had previously granted him. After hearing both sides of the argument, Judge Oshodi, however, remanded Imefili to the EFCC's custody and the second defendant to the Ikoi Correctional Center. The case was then postponed to April 11th in order to decide on bill and start the trial. We're joined in our discussion this morning by the Executive Director of the Sterling Law Center, Deji Ajare. Good morning, Mr. Ajare, and very, thank you very much for joining the show this morning. And looking at the case of Godwin Emefiele, it's taking a lot longer than many would have expected as we haven't even gotten into trial. We're still trying to decide on the matters of bail. Some have referred to this as an abuse of office. What, uh, pers what's your perspective regarding exactly how this matter has been handled? Uh, well, once, thank you very much for having me um, and good morning. Uh, the... the the manner in which the trial of uh, Godwin Emefiele is uh, going on, while uh, not necessarily violating any uh, uh, rules of procedure of courts, but it's just um, uh, it's it's a reminder of the the inefficiencies in our criminal justice system once again. Um, where uh, people are apprehended, arrested, and um, their freedoms curtailed on mere suspicion. People are arrested to be investigated here in our clients. A very, very uh, 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 improper procedure. Because in an ideal situation, a person may be invited for uh, I mean, interrogation, for questioning, to answer questions. But nobody should ordinarily be arrested until at least there is reasonable belief, reasonable grounds to um, um, keep them in detention. And that is why our constitution is clear. Uh, when it made the provisions for uh, detention of persons for a maximum of 48 hours, the assumption being that before you accost and arrest somebody and curtail their freedom, you already have some um, evidence in place with which you want to prosecute the person and it is expected that within the space of 48 hours you would have arranged the person properly in court and be ready for trial but what the efcc is doing what the dss has done with emay Feli clearly shows that emay Feli was arrested before investigations into uh, his alleged crimes even commenced and this is not just uh, uh, uh peculiar to uh, the uh, god doing emay Feli. this is exactly how law enforcement agents um act clearly um arresting persons detaining them getting spurious orders for courts for remand uh, only for them to start investigation and that is the reason um there, there was an initial arraignment and then these amended charges and then i assure you before the before the end of this whole saga there are going to be further amendment to these charges it is typical of our law enforcement agents there is something to take away from here what we need to take away from here is at the end of the day 
if somebody uh, of the stature of Godwin if Mifili as a former governor of the CBN is undergoing this kind of uh, um, uh, 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 experience now imagine what regular Nigerians would experience daily uh, in the hands of law enforcement agents persons who were arrested only because they were just working uh, uh, at the wrong place at the wrong time be arrested and kept in detention for several years for months and uh, i think for me that yes clearly would amount to an abuse of powers of law enforcement all right uh well there are also new charges uh, 26 26 uh, count uh, new charges as well that um, did come up on monday um, many are saying that it's starting to look like it's a witch hunt because there were some previously and now again new ones um, what do you make out of that now, um, you know, when you adopt improper procedure, when you adopt uh, 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 these kinds of tactics to keep somebody uh, locked up for a long time, you the allegations of... All right, Mr. DG. Okay. I guess we do have a network glitch there. All right, go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. You would agree with them that there is basis for them to suspect that this might be a witch hunt and of um um how um under the uh, government of uh, president muhammad buhari the former nsa the dasuki was kept in detention for practically throughout the tenure of, of the of the president then and with ultimately eventually he was released without I mean, conviction. So some of these things would lend credence to that suspicion that yes, this is a witch hunt. But of course, uh, the allegations, the fear that this might be a witch hunt will not be confirmed until the end of the entire saga. But I think ultimately what it calls us to do as a people, as a nation, is that we must strictly adhere to rules of procedure, whether before trial or during trial. If this Godwin Emefile case continues in the manner that it already is being run, where, uh, like many have said, and that you have agreed to, that um, he is not being the rule of law is not being followed, what are the fears about how this might might impact law enforcement in the coming years? Hello, Mr. Ajari, can you hear us? Okay. Um, it would seem that there's some form of disconnection with him. We're hoping that we can reconnect with him. And I'd like Mr. Jarari back with us. All right. Anyway, well, I think I think in one of his um, his, his comments, especially his analysis in the first uh, his first analysis, um, he did make mention that if if it's happening to the CBN governor this way, then you can as well imagine what it would look like or be like uh, for citizens of the country who may not have attained uh, the kind of status that a CBN governor um, For the everyday has. regular man. Yeah, no, exactly. For the because everyday regular, regular there is a, man. There's a stipulation as to exactly how law enforcement should carry out its responsibility. When you have a case against someone, you gather your facts, you bring them before a court of competent jurisdiction within a certain time frame. First of all, if we look at how they kept Godwin Emefiele in detention for over 60 days without any any uh, uh, evidence against him whatsoever that was already an infringement on his fundamental human rights and we've seen it happen not just with godwin emefile we saw it with um with uh, nam dikano we saw it with the former ESCC chair mm -hmm. uh, uh, bala but we've seen it with many people so you do your due diligence you have your your um investigation being carried out and show that you have enough evidence so when you can establish a prima facie case against the person you bring them before the court of uh, competent jurisdiction rather than doing it the other way around you you know arrest them then you start doing your detain investigation them. detain them looking for for evidence against them whether we like it or not i agree with him i mean many nigerians were not in support of him especially because of the uh, naira policy and how it impacted Nigerians, but we must call it speed is speed. We must be because the, the the risk in saying, oh yes, and it's good, let it happen to this person is that what goes around comes around. Mm -hmm. When it happened to the Jews, they say, Oh, it doesn't concern us. When it happened to this one, it doesn't concern us. By the time it happens to you, there'll be nobody left to speak for you. And that's exactly what the, the concern is with this. If we continue the fragrant abuse of 
law where the supremacy of the law over the rulers and the rules is not established and is not respected. Let's not expect a different tune to be sung when it's your turn or my turn, right? We, we want to be sure that ours is a country where adequate um, emphasis is, a, is placed on how things are being done. We're still joined, uh, our guest has joined us back. We have the executive director of the Sterling Law Center. We're looking at the Godwin Emefiele case. And I was asking you, you did allude to the fact that the rule of law is not being followed. So what are your fears and concerns? Should this matter continue in the way that it already has carried on? What are your fears and concerns about how this might impact law enforcement in the coming years? Well, um, I had already um, um, made reference earlier to the case of um, um, Jasuki, the former NSA under uh, 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 good luck Jonathan, who was arrested and kept in detention perpetually under the government of uh, President Mohamed Dubuari. Now, because things like that had happened in the past and there were no consequences, governments and subsequent you know, the, the government, governments are encouraged to you know, perpetuate similar activities, similar violations, clear violations of the rights of citizens and um, with the belief that ultimately they can get away with this without consequences now the fear for me and perhaps for those who have um, expressed concerns is that the C uh, SOL CBN governor may be put through a similar situation as someone like that Suki. and if that happens and there is no consequence what it means is that of course like you have already uh, we have already agreed that would be uh, clear uh, violations of the principles the rules the, the rule of law and that would mean that in subsequent years on subsequent under subsequent government the government same thing can happen to anyone including anybody even in this government no matter how powerful they are and for me it's still a, 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 a what 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 this day get, get brings us to is that if it can happen to anybody as powerful as this then it can happen to any citizen and if there is that possibility then we all should be worried as citizens of nigeria we all should be concerned and we all should speak out about it and one would expect that ultimately um persons who feel aggrieved such as this should take steps to get redress all right we've seen the judiciary come under fire in recent times uh, we've seen that happen uh in the cases like you've mentioned in the past uh, and i think as well during the elections the 2023 elections uh, we did see a lot of persons talk about uh, what the judiciary is indeed doing and how they are not so happy with it. Uh, can you share with us uh, what your thoughts are concerning the judiciary? Do you think um, uh, there needs to be some form of um, um, a review and uh, looking at how it carries out its executions, especially when it comes to the law? Anyway, I think, I think we're going to wrap up this conversation on, on, on that note. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, um, hopefully... When the network indeed uh, gets better, hopefully we'll get you back again so we can have this discussion. But then again, it's, uh, it's a developing story. Uh, until April 11th, Emifele is expected to return to the court. Don't forget, a 26-count charge, a new one, uh, was indeed put forth. And many people are saying, uh, why all of a sudden? But then again, like um, our guest as well did say that, especially when you did not do things the right way, uh, you keep seeing uh, things like this where different uh, charges are being brought up here and there, uh, trying to find which one could be used to indeed uh, pin uh, the former CBN governor down. But he's also being charged for abuse of office and also uh, improper use of, uh, of uh, improper spend of the Naira as well. But so many, so many. We're going to talk about that in the course of our conversation. Olive. All right. Uh, we'll take the conversation away from... Godwin Emefiele, the former CBN governor, to see the drama that's unfolding in Edo State. What looked like an impossible fit has led to the eventual impeachment of the embattled deputy governor of Edo State, Philip Shaiwu. The impeachment, which happened immediately after members of the Edo Assembly adopted the report of a seven-man investigative panel that was set up by Daniel Lukumbo, our chief judge of Edo State, was headed by S.A. Omanua, a retired justice, following the allegations of misconduct perjury and disclosure of government secrets has seen the former deputy governor reject his impeachment by the state house of assembly for well, the governor godwin obaseki immediately picked 38 year old or mobile um, godwin's 
as his deputy. Now, Godwins was sworn in as the number two citizen of Edo State. For many, they saw this coming. For some, it was an abuse of the judicial system. Well, joining us to discuss this further, we do have um, uh, two gentlemen who will be joining us in the course of this discussion. But, of course, uh, we'll be expecting to be joined by Barrister Monde Ubani, legal practitioner in Lagos, and, of course, Honorable Andrew um, Adeze Mwanta, President, African Public Interest Lawyers Union. But right now, we do have Andrew who's joining us. So, um, thank you so much for being here, Mr. Mwanta. Yeah, good morning. Good thank morning. you for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's no surprise that um, this actually happened yesterday. Uh, we do recall that there has been a build-up conversation uh, before this took place, especially here on Breakfast Central. I do recall where you joined as well as um, uh, another uh, legal practitioner. And our conversation was budging on the fact that uh, there was a, uh, uh, the primaries were taking place and what was happening in one uh, point, it was also taking place at another. But then again, let me get your reactions first to uh, the impeachment of the former, now former uh, Edo State Deputy Governor. Yeah, thank you for that question. I will start by saying that yesterday was a very sad day in the history of our democracy. It was a sad day for rule of law, and it was indeed a sad day for due process. We are not surprised because uh, this was the same governor who prevented 14 lawmakers from sitting. And uh, unfortunately, we were part of that government at the time. Even the president, the deputy governor who was illegally impeached yesterday was also part of that government. None of us resigned. So what is happening, I will not want to say it is not unconnected with Kama. And Obaseki, being the present governor of Edo State, has a four-year term, which will terminate on the 12th of November, 2024. We are talking of Godin Emefele today, who is undergoing trial. Another Godwin, of course, will face the law come November 12th, 2024. Obviously, what the governor is doing is a drama written by him, orchestrated by him, and delivered by him. A situation where last year he denied that he was not planning to impeach the deputy governor. And because the deputy governor was in court, we drew that matter. It is the reasons that he went to court that is being used as a basis for his, his illegal impeachment. I use the word illegal advisedly. Because the matter is in court. We were all in court yesterday morning. Obasaki sent five senior advocates, including Olu Ole Yamu his former, or rather his immediate past attorney general. The matter, of course, was adjourned to Thursday after the salary break, only for us to hear that, oh, they are doing impeachment in Benin. The panel that was set up, TV of those members, and including the chairman making for a party to that case, there was an order for them to come and show cause. They were sent with a copy of that order because we knew they would not acknowledge service. A senior advocate from our team went to the panel and informed them of a court order. But yet, they went ahead in the kangaroo fashion. A period of three months was stated in the appointment letter within which these issues should be investigated. In less than 48 hours, in the kangaroo fashion, they said they came up with a report. And you know, the House of Assembly is a rubber stamp of the governor. And as usual, and true to type, the, the rubber stamp did what can best be described as an alawada dance. Shibu on record was not giving a copy of that impeachment notice. After doing a cat and mouse game, they said they published it in the Nigerian, Obse uh, Nigerian Observer. And unfortunately, Section 188 sub to makes it mandatory that for the Shibu must be served with a copy of that impeachment notice. But that was not done. And that's why we went to court. As I earlier noted, four of those members, we wanted them to you know, um, recuse themselves because the Constitution is very clear. Section 26 talks about if you have a panel, you have the right to be informed of the offense, and members of that panel must be independent and impartial. And now, I'll the break down. The chairman is from Edo Central. He's one of the advocates that power must shift to Edo Central, and is opposed to the aspiration of a tribal. One of the members, a professor of law in the uh, University of Dasa University, is an appointee of Obaseki. Another was previously appointed into the NSAS committee. His name is President Adbukan. And one of them, the wife, is a strong supporter 
strong PDP member who have got recently appointed chairman of the welfare committee of the factional primaries in which Philip Shaibu you know, contested. So for us, we don't think people like this should be in a panel as, in, as important as that. The constitution is very clear. Section 180 is clear that these people should be people of integrity. They should not be, you know, those in the public, you know, service, not appointees of the governor. But all these were violated. Why are they afraid of uh, the judiciary? The matter was in court, or rather a matter is in court. The court had done to Thursday. You have a three months period. So why the haste? Okay, look at the person that was appointed by the governor. Under section 199, sub 3C, that young man was supposed to go before the House of Assembly and be cleared. I received the approval of the House of Assembly. But the governor did not do that. As early as uh, 8 years, they were already at the festival hall, even before the House of Assembly started sitting. The moment they heard that the deputy governor was impeached, the governor started serving in the other man without following the provisions of the constitution. So you ask me this question. Is Obaseki not lawless? Hmm. So oh, there's a the, the, the answer. Is very lawless. And he will pay for all these things. It's not these infractions against democracy, against the constitution. And let me tell you, people like Emir Fede, when they were a CBA governor, they violated laws. But today, I did not pay for it. And I assure you, come November 12th, Obaseki will lose his immunity and he's going to face the full rot of the law. Why do you say he will lose his humility? What do you mean? His tenure will end. He's not under his oh, humility oh. now to commit all kinds of uh, illegalities. He's perpetrating the highest level of the secretion of the Constitution. Oh. Look at the entire process, a complete charade. I know why I'm even worried is that Edo is always in the news for the bad reasons. You see how throughout last year, the man didn't do anything. It was impeachment. My question is, is impeachment an achievement of the government? I can tell you that over one billion of the Edo taxpayers' money has gone into this impeachment. And that is what we want the EFCC to investigate. The House of Assembly members, the chief judge, members of that panel, did they do all these things for free? Did they violate the law for free? I mean, these are foods for thought, which I think the EFCC, the ICPC, and the Code of Conduct should please take note of. And I will call on Mr. President, the way the governor has decided to desecrate the Constitution, the president must intervene. Is the father of the nation. When we had a similar situation on reverse, he didn't mind that the, PD, the person there was a PDP governor. He intervened. A situation where a man takes laws into his hands. A man, a deputy governor, team of the 20 years, he forcibly took him out from office last year. Now, he has ceremonially affected what he started since last year, and nobody is saying anything. Mr. We are Walter. destroying democracy. Mr. Walter, yesterday can be lacking to a coup d'etat. Don't huh? be there. I want to follow up from something you said. I had another question in mind, but I'll ask that later. You said the president should intervene, just similar to what happened in River State. Even on, up to today, the president, I said. yes, you said the president should intervene. Even up to today, there are many who criticize the intervention of the president because they say that what that has done is showing that the president is superior to the constitution because there was a provision for how that should be handled by law. If some people uh, resign from a political party, that seat is automatically declared vacant, and there's a constitutional provision for how that should be done. For the president's intervention, um, intervention coming and saying, you know, let's revert to status quo, was in a way showing that he was superior to the constitution. Do you agree with that position? And what sort of intervention would you have, uh, would you have wanted you know, to see on the part of the president here in Edo State? You know, every case is decided on its merits. The decision they reached in Rivers was by agreement, and uh, part of it was that some matters in court should, should be withdrawn. I don't think Mr. President would have, would have advised that they violated provisions of the Constitution. And you've heard the government of Rivers State say severely that they are ready to succumb, you know, to whatever arrangements they have, no matter how uh, painful, you know, same may be. But we know we have a very stubborn government. We don't expect him to yield to Mr. President's intervention. But when I say intervention, I mean by ensuring that law and order is obeyed. The present person who was appointed, there's no way you can become deputy governor without following the constitution. Mr. Right. Well, we seem to have a network challenges again uh, concerning this conversation. But this is really, this is really, really a conversation we want to we want to look at. Um, our guest uh, has indeed uh, brought out some very salient points. But if you can hear me, Mr. Nwanta, uh, go ahead with your with your, your your point here. No, I'm saying that there's a procedure to occupy the public office. Even the office of governor, there's a procedure for election into that office. 
And that's why I said Section 191, Sub 3C, also gives a provision in the event of a casual vacancy of the office of the governor, how that office can be occupied. You don't put the cart before the horse. So why the haste? Why was this man not sent to the House of Assembly? Because you know that by Thursday, the courts will make a pronouncement. So to force a fatal company on the court, they hurriedly swore him in, simultaneously with the purported impeachment of Shaibo. My worry is that democracy is being put on his head, it's being stood on his head. My worry is that the governor has violated very important provisions of the constitution on succession of power, because this is what we call a coup d'etat. When you occupy public office and elected public office through an democratic means, what is that? Obviously, it violates the provisions of Section 1 sub 2 that prescribes the method for which power can be taken and that any method other, other than that is illegal, is unconstitutional. So what the governor has done is a civilian coup d'etat, hmm. a matter in court. And it was his uncle, Obaseki, or, or Andrew, Andrews Obaseki GSC, in the case of Ujuku versus Governor of Lagos State, that said the executive lawlessness is tantamount to a deliberate violation of the Constitution. So Obaseki has started his own dictatorship on a pedestal of executive lawlessness, and he must be called to order. He's not the owner of a do state. He's not the god of a do politics. He has every right to play politics of capitalism, which is playing now. The reason why they are doing all these things is to bring in somebody they can use for the election from Akoko Edo, because a young man said it yesterday on the TV program that the reason why they brought him on board is for him to help them get votes in Akoko Edo. So Edo state has now been turned to a place where the government you know, picks and choose. And that's very unfortunate. It's dangerous to democracy. It's dangerous to the sustenance of the rule of law. And there's no way this can be allowed to pass. The matter is in court, and we expect that the judiciary will rise to the occasion. All right. To stop uh, this act of illegality. Okay. Well, I'm going to bring in uh, Barista Monde Ubani. He's a legal practitioner here in Lagos, and uh, he'll be joining us as well. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ubani. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding this? There's several. Uh, Perspectives that have been discussed this morning are all the guests. Honorable Enwanta has shared his perspective regarding the impeachment of the Deputy Governor of Edo State. What's your position on that? Legal, illegal, or what, what stand are you taking? Uh, uh, th thank you very much. You know, uh, I just joined. I'm, I'm very sorry about uh, uh, joining a bit late, you know, so I may not have uh, heard the perspectives of my colleagues. Uh, but as you have asked me, I have my own perspective concerning what happened uh, in Edo. What is playing out presently in Edo is rather unfortunate, and uh, I need we need need also to blame uh, partly uh, the constitutional provision that is not clearly explicit with regards to what amounts uh, to gross misconduct, uh, because uh, gross misconduct is whatever the house uh, term it to be is not properly defined. Uh, and it has been used over time by the members of the Legislative Assembly to do all manner of things. Uh, the moment uh, the Deputy Governor uh, brought himself out, saying that he's going to contest uh, the position of governorship in a uh, state, uh, contrary to the desire of his boss, I knew that the man was in trouble, going to be in trouble. Uh, and also wanting to contest that election under the same platform uh, that the that the boss you know came into power with, and that is the, the PDP. He didn't even seek to go to another political party. He wanted to contest that the gubernatorial election under PDP, and his boss has actually clearly indicated that he has a choice, and that he, the candidate is not the deputy governor. So he went and participated, and even declared himself a winner. And so the governor now resorted to using the members of the house in order to uh, to remove him, which is what he has done. I commented in this particular television that the moment the house has started the process of uh, impeachment, that the man is gone. The only thing is that he may have a remedy in court, but that is thereafter. If they would have completed the entire process, they will remove him from office, will have access to the office again, they will stop paying his salaries and that. Uh, Duties and I mean whatever is entitled to. And in this case, we go as far as going to Supreme Court, which may have which may take up to 15 years or thereabout before it is clearly resolved. After which the man would have you know completed his tenure and all that you know. So it's clearly an unfortunate incident. 
and the only sin he has committed, and they know it, even the so-called misconduct, is because he contested the primaries, contrary to the desire of his boss. That's all. But they have found whatever they have come up with all manner of allegation and levied it on his head, and now they have uh, sent him packing. It's rather unfortunate. It's a system. It's a systemic thing. In Nigerian politics, the moment you are a deputy, or the moment you are appointed, what they expect from you is 120% loyalty. 120%, not 100%, even more than 100%. The moment you show any act of disloyalty, the system works against you. And it has been it has happened in several instances, and it's, uh, it's quite unfortunate. You know, it's only a few instances that deputy governors have actually succeeded in uh, going contrary to the wish of their boss. I remember Omahi. Omahi went out against his uh, the boss, his boss wish, and eventually emerged as governor. The same thing with Akwabi. Akwabi was the only a commissioner even. He went out against the, the desire of his boss and emerged as a governor. But so for you to go against your boss in any gubernatorial election, it must be well loaded. It must be well connected. It must be very, very strong. It must be a man of timber and caliber. You, you destroy the system. It's a systemic, you have to destroy the entire system. But unfortunately, Shuabu could not pull it through. And look at the consequences now. It's gone. But the, the remedy in court may come later, after which uh, somebody may regard it as academic exercise. An unfortunate thing. It has happened. It has happened. Okay, I just want to follow up from that question. So it would seem that you and Mr. Iwanta are on the similar side of the divide. Do you trust the judiciary to be able to resolve this matter in favor, maybe in favor of Philip Shaibu? And I'm asking this. Because earlier in the conversation, Mr. Nwata had said that it's time for Mr. President to intervene to ensure that you know the right thing is done. So are we, can we trust that the judiciary will do what needs to be done? And do you think that this will go in his favor, maybe? Okay, I know that's sort of preempting the, the court. But like, yeah, do we right, trust yeah, the judiciary? Yeah, there are decided, yeah, there are decided cases. Uh, I think the judiciary was... Uh, they sought the intervention of the judicial system uh, in Abuja. And the court, even though they did not make any express pronouncement as to granting interim injunction, said, look, uh, I will want the State House of Assembly and all that who were sued to come and explain uh, why that particular relief they were seeking for would not be granted. In other words, the matter was least pending. It was already a matter in court uh, before the impeachment process took place. So now, before the court could hear all the parties in the matter, they have already gone ahead to impeach. So, I think at the end, with all the decided authorities and all that, if the court discovers there is a breach in the procedure, what the law says is that the judiciary should not intervene whenever the House, you know, has taken any part or any proceeding in terms of uh, impeachment. The court's power is clearly ousted. But wherever the court discovers that in, in the impeachment process, that the House has not followed st strictly the provisions of the constitution especially all the procedural you know uh, outline in the constitution if they don't follow it the court have always come up with a decision in favor of the impeached and we have several decided cases so it's only when the court discovered that the procedure was not complied with then the court will actually grant uh, a remedy in favor it has happened there are already decided cases up to supreme court level so i am very hopeful that if the man can be able to uh, prove that there was a breach in the process of this impeachment uh, proceeding, then the court will grant remedy. But if there is not, and they have complied strictly with all the provisions as outlined in the Constitution with regards to impeachment proceedings, then the court will actually say, look, well, my powers with regard to that is clearly ousted. So that, that is what I think will happen. Uh, let them uh, put all their facts together, put all the evidences together, in order to convince the court that there is procedural irregularity, it's only in that circumstance that the court can come to their rescue. Uh, that is my opinion about the uh, judicial intervention. All right. Um, uh, Honorable Emanta, I mean, there was a court notice that was served, um, and you also talked about it. Um, I think we should have it on the screen as well. Um, my question to you simply is this. Uh, I mean, there's a notice to obtain a complaint form, uh, to file a formal complaint against Honorable Justice Daniel uh, Okumboa. Uh, the chief judge of the Edo State for abuse of office, official misconduct, and desecrating his oath of office. Uh, putting all of this together, uh, do you do you do you see any positivity or any positive light at the end of the tunnel 
especially looking at what has taken place. And you also make mention that uh, the provision, of course, like you mentioned, makes uh, uh, room uh, before another deputy governor is appointed. He must have gone to the House of Assembly, but we did not see that yesterday. So are you also saying, I'm asking two questions, please take note. The first one, um, are there any hopes that um, your notice being served to the Apex Court will, will yield? Secondly, um, the current um, um, Deputy Governor, Godwins, are you saying that his appointment is illegal? Is the question directed to me? No, no let, let me listen to Honorable uh, Mwanta. I'll come back to you. Um, first yeah, thank you. I'm not just saying that the appointment is illegal, but it's also unconstitutional. I want to... Uh, Okay, we seem to have a little connectivity challenge there with uh, Honorable M. Wanta. Okay, let's, let's, let's just see if we can get him back so he could give us uh, an answer or answers to these questions. And what uh, my oh. colleague had said. Go on. Go ahead, please. Can I continue? Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. please. I said just to align with what my uh, learned colleague had said, Mr. Obani, once the court establishes that there are procedural irregularities, certainly the court will intervene. Certainly, the court will intervene. And as I as... Mm. Okay. From all the things they've done so far, compliance was not done at all. First, the way and manner the deputy governor was impeached, he was given notice, as I earlier mentioned, of the impeachment um, allegations. Secondly, five, four members of that panel, we told them to recuse themselves and the action will fight. And of course, an order was obtained for them to show cause. And they refused to obey that order. They refused to obey that order. The chief judge was served with a copy of that order. He went ahead to inaugurate the panel. The panel sat, even after they were served with that court order, for them to come and show cause on Monday. And were in court yesterday. They attorney, former attorney general of the state and four other senior advocates were sent by the government. The matter was adjourned to Thursday. Only for us to hear about two hours later that they have impeached the deputy governor. The panel had till the months to do their work. So why the haste? Talking about the appointment of the other person that was uh, made deputy governor yesterday, the House of Assembly must give approval under Section 191 sub 3C. But that was not followed. So when you come into a government position as important as that of the deputy governor through the back door, is that not an illegal act? Of course, the courts will declare these things as illegal. In the days ahead, I assure Nigerians, it does not matter how long it takes to get justice. Though the wind of the wheels of justice may grow slowly, but it's sure. And also to state clearly that for the chief judge who participated in this thing, it's not above the law. The National Judicial Council is not there for nothing. When a judicial officer misconducts himself or misdemeans himself, a petition will be formally written, which we have done already. And this is uh, Daniel Okumbo, the chief judge of the decision. We're going to explain why you should remain as chief judge because he has started acting politically. Everything the chief judge did was not act, he didn't act judicially, but he acted politically. This is a chief judge that swore in that man yesterday. Did the Alpha Assembly clear him? As chief judge of the state, before he became a substantive chief judge, was it not clear by the Alpha Assembly? Did he ask questions? Must a man behave like a zombie? As a chief judge, he's supposed to be the person in charge of the judiciary. It's just that we said that John Jonah is the chief law officer of the state. The chief judge is the chief law officer of the state in so the instance he... of the world. He must ensure compliance with the law. The duty of the judiciary is to insist that the constitution should be obeyed. So, do you... so it's so... quite unfortunate that the chief judge has now associated himself with the executive, now has subjugated the judiciary of Edo State to the governor of Edo State. Eight judges have not been sworn in. This man is very comfortable as chief judge. He has not been able to question why the governor has refused to swear in eight judges who have been cleared by the National Judicial Council. And we're going to include in our petition that the chief judge of Edo State should be investigated for that, for complicity. Hmm. All right. Uh, so I think uh, the final question would be for both of you, for Mr. Nwanta and Mr. Albani. What's the future for uh, Philip Schreiber and how do you think this will impact his political career? I'll start with Mr. Nwanta and then we'll head to Mr. Albani. Mr. Honorary Wanta, are you there? Okay, I'm here. Yes, please go ahead. So, I think uh, because the matter is in court, we'll just leave it there. Because, uh, as I earlier noted, just the way the governor's uncle 
Andrew Zotuto Obaseki once said. He said, executive lawlessness is a deliberate violation, is tantamount to a deliberate violation of the Constitution. And remember to put out GSC, talked about this idea of executive lawlessness in the case of Obaseki, sorry, in the case of Ujuku and governor of Lagos State. Remember in that case, Ujuku in that case was the person whose house the Alaska law in Lagos was ransacked. The matter was in court. Okay. In between the time the matter traveled from the High Court to the Court of Appeal, the governor, of, the military governor of Lagos State took of Lagos State took laws into his hands. And of course, the Supreme Court condemned it. And the facts of that case are not very different from this one. A court order was given, but the panel went ahead against that court order. Having been said, the chief judge was complicit because he participated in the entire process after having served the copy of that court order. The House of Assembly, of course, was a part in that case, they said. They went ahead to impeach the deputy governor. But we live in a constitutional democracy, and the matter is in court. So we know the court will intervene, because the matter is already before them. And the rule of law will be restored, or Basaki's act of illegality will be declared so. And at the end of the day, Shaibu's rights yeah. as deputy governor of the state, elected deputy governor of the state, will be fully restored. <laughs> All right. Um, we've run out of time. Mr. Albani, please, as quickly as possible, maybe in 30 seconds. How do you think this would affect him if the court rules in his favor and if the court rules against him? Uh, the, the point is that we have, you know, as my colleague has rightly pointed out, uh, the matter is of judice. Uh, we expect the judiciary to intervene. Uh, but my only problem with the judicial intervention is that before the judiciary will resolve the matter, uh, going from the lower court to the Supreme Court, the, the tenure of uh, Barsegui would have ended, the tenure of the the new deputy governor would have ended. So whatever victory he will uh, he will obtain uh, would be known as uh, a direct victory. Uh, may not necessarily, you know, put him back as a deputy governor. Uh, it, on record, he would be regarded as deputy governor, but he wouldn't occupy that position because the tenure would have elapsed. You know, so that's the only problem we may have. But as for getting justice, you know, we have absolute faith in our judicial sector that at the end, whatever error, whatever error must have been committed against any of the parties will certainly be redressed you know as for the political career of any person it is the people that determines the political career of any person i don't know what shuabu would be uh, later i don't know what the new deputy governor's career will be it's clearly in the hand of the almighty and also in the hand of the Edo people who eventually will uh, begin to make choices you know even as we progress as a nation uh, so that's all i can say concerning that thank you so much um barrister monday ubani a legal practitioner and also, Honorable Andrew Adeze and Wanta for joining us in this conversation. Uh, please, gentlemen, do keep your phone lines open. We look forward to continuing this conversation, of course, uh, looking what the court would say, especially on Thursday. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. All right. Breakfast Central, right here. Let's bring to you a quick recap uh, of the stories we've had thus far this first hour. The first hour this morning on Breakfast Central, we have discussed, no doubt, Edo Assembly impeaching Philip Scheibe as Deputy Governor. You did hear from our guests where they did broke things down and the future concerning that situation. Court remains Mifid in EFCC custody. A very sad situation until April 11 when he will return to the court again. Continue abducted worshippers regained freedom. A very bittersweet story um, having lost one of them. But indeed, we are thankful that they are alive. What's coming up next for the second hour? For the second hour, pro Abure protesters set for showdown with NLC. And we review the newspaper front pages when we open the phone lines as well so you can join us. We also have what, we, what we're showing later today. We'll show you that on our programs to watch. Stick with us. Welcome back to Breakfast Central if you're just joining us. You're right in time for our newspaper review. We're looking at the front pages of the newspapers to see what the big headlines are saying. We'll be delving into this with the publisher of the niche newspaper, Ikechuku Amichi. It's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining us. And happy holidays. You're working on a holiday. <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a man. Come on, he's a press man. He knows there's no break. No break for us. <laughs> no break. So no we're rest. happy. No rest. The holy book says no rest for the wicked. So who's wicked? I don't know. It's just I'm just quoting the scripture. <laughs> 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 All right, let's head into the uh, newspapers and see what the front pages are saying. Our first paper for today will be uh, this Nigerian newspaper. And on the front page of this Nigerian newspaper, Edo Obaseki finally knocks out Shaibu. 
In a predictable outcome, <laughs> Assembly impeaches Deputy Governor on alleged gross misconduct. Ex-Deputy Governor vows to fight on in an emotional farewell broadcast. 38-year-old Omobayo Godwin takes over, so it's Godwin Square in, a, in a Edo State. Obasaki Godwin Governor, another Godwin as a Deputy Governor. We can shout Abuja ICC for renovation. Stakeholders approve transition. Committee for Labour Party as OB6 reconciliation. EFCC quizzes 14 suspected oil thieves in Port Harcourt. Refuse 30 billion naira probe against Better Edru. CBN bans use of foreign currency as collateral for naira. Sells 1,101 naira to one dollars to the BDC. And uh, <laughs> that's a, a photo there of when the going was good. <laughs> yeah, uh, between Obaseki and the uh, Shaibu. Of course, the final story, okay, I think we should take some final story. $4.5 billion, 2.8 billion naira. A mafia to cool his heels in EFCC custody. Cut a John's case to Thursday. What a headline. To cool. To cool his heels. <laughs> Before we get to the Edo Obaseki story, which we obviously want to talk about, very quickly, let's talk about Emi Fili and how his matter has been handled. Yet again, he's been denied bail. Would you say that the matter has been handled uh, in a way that it should be? Uh, many have said that it's against the rule of law, the manner in which he's been handled. So what are your thoughts on how he's been handled and what this will mean for law enforcement in the coming years? For me, uh, I think uh, I think the most important thing about the Mefele thing is the Mefele saga. It's to ensure that we don't um, we stop the media trial. If a Mefele has a case to answer, and the government is saying that he has a case to answer, let the court handle it. This this issue of uh, multiple charges in multiple calls, multiple jurisdictions, I don't think it is fair. If Emefile has committed any crime against the Nigerian state, of course, I've always been an advocate that those who occupy public uh, offices in Nigeria should be held accountable for what they do and what they didn't do in office. That's about the only way we can sanitize this country. The level of impunity we have is, is so outrageous. And because people know that they can always get away with blue murder in office, they will always do the very outrageous. So let the courts do the needful. Let the government or the prosecutors, EFCC, let them present whatever evidence they think they have against MFLA in court. MFLA has pleaded not guilty to the uh, new charges that were brought uh, yesterday. The court uh, refused to grant him bail until April 11th. April 11th is uh, around the corner. Today is 9th. Let us wait until that day. But don't forget that he has also been granted bail. Before now. Before now. Exactly. I think on two different occasions. I would have thought that he would have continued enjoying that bell, knowing now that uh, MFL is not a flight risk. He's not running away. He's been going to court to answer all the charges in the two previous uh, lessons that have been brought against him. I would have thought that the judge would have been magnanimous enough to say, okay, continue on the previous bail uh, terms that you've been enjoying. But of course, bail is at the discretion of the, of the court. So let's see what's going to happen on April 11th. Let him face trial. Let him defend himself. If at the end of the day, he's able to prove that he is innocent of all the charges that, he, that have been brought against him, fine. If he is not, then, he has to account for whatever he did in office. But my worry in all this is that, look, nobody's talking about President Muhammad Buhari. I was going to... Uh, <coughs> okay, please, just... Nobody's talking that. about President Muhammad Buhari. It's as if the Tinubu administration, for whatever, has singled out MFLA as the scapegoat of the Buhari administration. We have... We have in fact, we've had 
there's a school of thought that believes that Buhari's government was the most corrupt in the history of this country. And we have ministries, those who floated bogus airlines, those who did all sorts. Because Emefele was a CBN governor under Buhari's tenure, and he wouldn't have acted without certain um, approvals. Exactly. So why is nobody talking about President Muhammad Buhari? Why has he not been pulled in for some questioning? Look, this idea that once you are a president, then you enjoy Section 308 of the Constitution, which grants immunity while you are in office. You enjoy it for life. A messenger is untouchable. Jonathan is untouchable. Buhari is untouchable. Tinubu will also be untouchable. When people know that there are no consequences for the actions they take in office, impunity reigns supreme. Absolutely. I mean, say what you want about South Africa. That's the one thing you can't force See, them about. Beyond the South Africa, I did an article, my column last week, dwelt extensively on that. I did a research since year 2020, over 70 countries all around the world have put their former presidents on trial. Mm. In, in, uh, in uh, South Korea, two presidents have gone to jail. In fact, the first woman president of South Korea was jailed. The other man took the easy way out and committed suicide. In U.S. as we speak, Donald Trump is being tried. So, all over the place, South Africa, Zuma, in Israel, a former prime minister was tried and jailed. Even Benjamin Netanyahu, that is the current prime minister, is also facing trial. So, there's nothing big. And Iceland, in fact, did what they tried their prime minister on two charges or so. They couldn't convict him on the two major charges, but they convicted him all the same. Do you know on what ground that he failed to provide governance? So the inability in itself to govern well in very serious countries is considered a crime because you are elected to provide leadership, not elected to deepen the hardship and the misery of the people. Yes, indeed. I mean, when they come into office, they swear to make lives better for the Nigerian people, swear with the Bible, swear with the Quran. At the end of the day, they don't fulfill half of what that swear, you know, or that oath entails. They but they don't fulfill anything. If you're talking about half, at least that's even making an effort. We could give them the privilege that, mm. okay, they did their best. Every government, Buhari took from where in, where Nigeria was in May uh, 29, 2015, when he became president. If Buhari had left Nigeria and Nigerians at that spot when he left last year, nobody would have been crying. Buhari took Nigeria from that point. From top to bottom. From Literally. top not to bottom, as he promised. Exactly. All right. Yes. Uh, let's get to the next paper. I would have said we should look at the Edo story, but I'm sure the next paper will definitely come Surely, right. surely it does. So let's let's go that. to uh, Daily Trust now. Don't forget, you can also be part of the conversation, and uh, you can reach us, and let's know what your thoughts are, especially about the uh, Edo, Edo State um, you know, issues. Chai will become 17th impeached deputy governor since 1999, a moment of uh, democracy. Uh, um, what um, Daily Trust does, it gives us a, a, a entire picture, an entire picture of governors and what states that they were impeached from. Akwaibom is there, Bochi, Bayosa, Edo, and the likes, Oyo as well, Taraba, Zamfara, you have that there. So Shwaibu becomes the 17th, and that impeachment process um, took place yesterday. Better Edu, EFCC recovers 30 billion now, investigates 50 accounts, 
And yet, there's also another statement from EFCC, I don't know if you saw that as well, saying that they are not investigating a better edu as well. Hmm. Okay, let's take another story very quickly ahead. NEC meeting, uh, PDP reps demand Damagun's resignation. It's, uh, it's hotting up in every political party now. Uh, Ajula Zabure is facing his uh, with Labour Party. You also have PDP going through theirs. And then APC as well is facing its own too uh, with the um, uh, Kaduna State Governor uh, who's ready to take him back to court. CBN approves um, uh, Forex uh, sales to BDCs at 1,101. Salah, low turnout at markets. Well, we'll leave that for the economists. Let's look at the Shaibu story right about now. Well, the, 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 uh, the Shaibu story, I would be surprised if uh, Shaibu didn't see it coming. Uh, it was it was apparent that it was going to go, um, and uh, Nashaibi has been there uh, all this while. Don't forget he was uh, a legislator uh, in Edo. Then he was also a member of the House of uh, Representatives, and he's been governor now, uh, deputy governor now for almost eight years. So he knows how the system works. I like what. Uh, I like what uh, Daily Trust did. He is the 17th deputy governor to be impeached since 1999. I've not read that story in detail, but I would also be surprised if uh, Daily Trust did not point out the fact that most, if not all, the 17 deputy governors, the impeachments were instigated by their principal, the governors. Engineer Abaribe, Senator Engineer Abaribe, was impeached in Abia State. It was instigated by his principal then, Governor Ojo Zokalo. And you can go on and on and on and on. You ask yourself, uh, my honest opinion on this is that I didn't see what crime Shaibu committed ambition by saying I want to run Pedri uh, for the governorship and for me that was the only crime that he committed if he did not put himself forward as against the wish of his principal governor Obaseki this impeachment yesterday would not have uh, happened and that also tells you the state of our democracy. That is what is important to me. Where the people decide who governs them, which is what democracy is all about. Government of the people by the people, for the people. If the votes of the people really count in who governs them, even from internal party democracy, which is a primary election, why should you bother? about who wants to run or not. Let the people decide. Why should you stop somebody? Because you don't want him. And what is exactly the role of a deputy governor in, in all this set up? If, if your principal wakes up tomorrow morning and does not like your face, he gets rid of you. President Tinubu got rid of two deputy governors in Lagos State, Pedro and, uh, and uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, I can't remember her name. Her name skips my head. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Senator uh, uh, Kofoola. So, he, 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 and you go on and on and on. The man wakes up in the morning. You guys went on a joint ticket. He doesn't like you again, or he thinks you are a threat to his own political calculations, and he simply instigates the State House of Assembly to throw you out, and you are out in the court. charges of misconduct. But again, I don't pity Nashraibu. They are all better, uh, uh, best of the same na plumage. All these things is that the Nigerian, the average Nigerian politician is a dictator. This was exactly what Obaseki fought 
four years ago, when his own godfather, Senator Adam Oshomole, wanted to throw him under the bus, he was able to survive with the help of this same Nashaibu. Now he has thrown Shaibu under the bus, and there's nobody out there who is going to speak for Nashaibu. So it's a very sad uh, commentary. He's out in the cold. I don't know what other alternatives he said he's going to court, but he's impeached, he's impeached. And, and this is a lot of entitlement and because, the benefits that would have come with yeah. his office. And that was the idea to punish him. The idea of the impeachment is to punish him. Because his time is almost over. November is the, just the, around the, the corner. The, the election is in November, and he's a lame dog, as it were. So they had already chased him out of his official office. So there is nothing. He does not have any clout whatsoever in a do state politics now, particularly the PDP uh, 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 politics. So if they wanted to leave him, they could have left him. The idea of the impe impeachment is to, to show, ridicule him. Is to ensure that he doesn't get any benefits. Look, huh? I am in charge, and you have to pay for the price. Yeah, you have to pay the price. So is this the end of, of his political career? Of disloyalty. I don't see how he's going to come back. Honestly, I don't see how he's going to come back. No matter who wins the 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 election, don't forget that Shaibu was a godson. It was Adam to Shomale, Shomale, yes. that you know, propped him and brought him into political uh, 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 limelight. Now, he is estranged from Adam Oshomole and, and also <laughs> and Obaseki. And he also went against. That is also where I blame him. The how can you go against the zoning the formula which wanted to give every senatorial zone in a do state a bite of the pie? So he, of course, I mean... Like he, uh, 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 um, Shaibu comes almost from the same uh, community with Adams. Oshomole. Oshomole. Adams Oshomole was governor for eight years now, for God's sake. I think a do not in the senatorial zone. And you want to again be governor what of the other zone that so, has not so can we say that it's fair then obaseki's perspective because yes edo central has had its turn edo sorry edo north has had its turn edo south has had its turn and obaseki was of the perspective that it's time for the edo central people to have their turn so because you said earlier that you see no crime he committed ex except putting himself out to be governor so is there maybe some logic or some sense to obaseki's no you, 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 you cannot uh fault Obaseki on that score given the circumstances of our political uh, development where it is okay and that's the same logic we extended to the election last year the north had been in power for eight years therefore it should come to the south so there and the, the point I was trying to make is that if our politics is all about the people. If the votes of the people really count, Edo people should be um, smart enough to know who to vote for. And considering the people that are as they are contesting this election, I don't see how Shaibu, even if he had been the PDP candidate, would have stood any chance of, of winning. To deepen our democracy, the people, the people must own it. I heard this idea of Godfathers determining who the next anointed candidate will be. Exactly. And that is where I disagree with what happened in Edo yesterday. Not on the ground that anybody can fault what Obaseki is trying to do because it's about equity, it's about fairness, it's about justice. When you say that power must go around the three uh, zones that make up a do state. All right. Uh, let's move away from that paper and try and see if we can squeeze in one more paper, the Punch newspaper. On the front page of the Punch newspaper, our final uh, paper this morning,
The big story is banks get three month deadline to stop forex backed loans. Banks customers begin negotiation to liquidate loans and freeze dumb account balances. Naira rises to 1,220 Naira as CBN sells FX to bureau the exchange operators at 1,101 Naira to the dollar. Abaseki swears a new deputy as assembly sacks Shaibu. Sultan declares Wednesday Idel Fitri, 70,500 security personnel deployed. I'm seeing that there's also an additional day. I can't confirm that the Minister of Interior has also added Thursday as a public holiday. Yes, he has. It can okay. be confirmed. I think he, he tweeted that um, on his ex account. But this holiday is sweet. Um, yeah, well, you wouldn't say it's sweet. Don't forget that um, he came under fire when he announced the holiday for Tuesday, um, Wednesday. Tuesday, Wednesday. And everybody was saying, no, it's supposed to be Wednesday, Thursday, not Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday. And, of course, the, the moon was not sighted. So until now that um, it was announced that it's going to be Wednesday, it has no other choice than to it, add it, 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 to it. Well, I don't know why they had to jump the gun. You wait for the Sultan first? Yeah. They should have waited you know, for the Sultan. And the Sultan also apparently was uh, for the uh, signal from Saudi Arabia. Yesterday, uh, Saudi Arabia, the news that came, said that, they they had not, as at yesterday, cited the moon, and therefore that the uh, this thing will be on edifice. It will be on Wednesday. That was when the uh, the whole lot in Nigeria started na scrambling, and to imagine that a country, look, Olive and uh, Joe. How many public holidays do we have in a year? A lot. It doesn't make sense. Now, you are taking Tuesday, Wednesday, and now Thursday. Thursday. And when that is done, know that the week is gone. Friday is half day. On Friday. So it doesn't it doesn't make sense whatsoever. If 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 the Eden uh, feature is going to be on Wednesday, and you had already declared Tuesday, Wednesday, so why take Thursday again? It smacks of unseriousness. We are we are unserious in this country. You are taking three days. You are just coming out of that of uh, Easter, Good Friday, Easter Monday, as probably. Uh, called days, we are taking another three days in a country where productivity is an issue. I don't know how we continue doing this. Okay, let's still look at the front page of the Punch newspaper as to see what other stories are there besides the announcement of the holidays. It may feel a return to ESCC custody faces fourth arraignment April 25th. Total solar eclipse Hits Mexico, U.S., Canada. We saw videos of that. WK Fubara feud splits PDP. 60 reps demand chairman's resignation. NMPCL faces $3 billion backlog on petrol payments, according to report. Federal government may get $1 billion Afrexim bank loan in May. EFCC probes 50 accounts linked to humanitarian ministry. It does seem that we have an update uh, regarding the Better Edu saga. Uh, I would like you to react to that, but let's also talk about NNPCL facing $3 billion backlog on petrol payments, according to report. <laughs> I don't want to talk about NN, uh, NNPCL because, because it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't make sense. That's about the most opaque oil, national oil uh, company that I know of. And you can't continue doing things that way and expect that you will get a different result from what we are getting now. The clue that we are even talking about now, some of them have been sold in advance. And that is why a Dangote refinery, for instance, is going to the U.S. to buy crude oil. Uh, uh, to service the refinery. So that even if the so-called Port Harcourt refinery and all that, if they come on stream today, they won't have crude to 
operates. So the 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 the, the, the uh, that issue, I, I I don't think I don't think it is unless and until Nigerians demand that these national institutions work the way they ought to work. President uh, Buhari came on board and became the Minister of Petroleum for eight years. What did he achieve? Today, President Muhammad Buhari is the President, uh, uh, is a Minister of Na Petroleum. It is the same thing. We don't get to know what is happening there. And that is the agency, that is the decent that crew that counts for over 70%, if not more, of our foreign exchange earnings. Yet, we don't get to know. Nobody can say for sure the quantity of crude oil that is produced in Nigeria every day. The quantity that is stolen and accountability remains an issue. And as long as accountability remains an issue, we will continue moving around in this vicious circle. Then, then the better do uh, thing. Well, EFCC is not saying they have recovered 30 billion uh, naira, mm -hmm. and then they are proving 50 accounts. I don't know whether the 50 accounts are better those personal accounts or 50 accounts that we are opened in the name of that uh, ministry. Whatever is the case, if you have recovered 50, 30 billion, it then means you have a prima facie case already. They should charge her to court, to court and prosecute her for whatever crimes. You can't, you can't prove this endlessly. If you say you have recovered 30 billion from one public, from a person that used to be a public officer, if you've recovered 30 billion, it means you have established a case, charge her to court. And all others associated with that fraud must also be brought to book. Those that worked with Muhammad Nabuhari in that same ministry, that committed the same crime that Bete Du is alleged to have committed, should all be hauled before courts of competent jurisdiction to go and explain how they manage our national assets period. Unless we do that, this media trial, EFCC will come out today, they will tell you one thing, particularly when there is an issue there, they want to divert attention, they bring up something. Let the cases go to court. If you have recovered 30 billion, billion you have established a case, let it go to court. All right. I want to say thank you so much uh, for joining us, um, Mr. Keichuku Amichi, publisher at the Niche newspaper um conversations uh, definitely will continue and we'll be here to bring them to you um you can join him again when he comes back uh, same time next week on the front pages of the papers we'll go for a quick break when we come back we'll be joining our man who is live in benin city especially where uh, the current situation is definitely getting a lot of persons uh, talking stay with us we'll be right back Welcome back to Breakfast Central, where this time around we're going to be looking at what exactly is happening in Labour Party with the crisis. Uh, pro Abure protesters have, of course, set a showdown with the NLC. Uh, we'll go on. Uh, we also have our man Bernard, who is in Edo State, who will be joining us to give us status update. And right after that, we'll head over to uh, bring you the NLC update. But for now, good morning, Bernard. What's happening? I hear that the Deputy Governor has been impeached. What exactly is going on in Edo State? Uh, good morning, Olive. Good morning, Joe. Um, morning. It's a public holiday here in Edo State um, and uh, across the country, as a matter of fact. But before the public holiday, of course, the big shocker for many people was that, you know, um, 
the removal, so to speak, or the impeachment of the, would I call him now, former deputy governor, Philip Shaibu, uh, from his position. Of course, he's been embattled, if you want to use that, uh, those words, um, for the past one year. He and his uh, principal, the governor, um, Godin Obasaki, have not exactly been in good terms. And that also came to play um, during the party primaries, where Obasaki, um, you know, wanted to run uh, for the party's ticket, but unfortunately that didn't happen. So now we see that there is a new deputy governor who's been sworn in yesterday already and has assumed office. Now, from what I've been able to gather, for those who I spoke to, and um, if you read the comments uh, that followed uh, um, um, Philip Shaibu's post yesterday, the video he put out complaining about, about his illegal and unlawful removal, as he put it, you'll see that there were people, Edolites as they're called, who came under that, that video uh, to talk about Philip Shaibu not following the due political process of the state. Now, Edo State, like many other states, from what I've been able to gather, also follows the principle of zoning when it comes to selecting their governor. Um, Adam Soshomala, the former governor, was from Edo North. Uh, the current governor, who is um, Godwin Obasaki, is from Edo South. And, you know, based on the zoning arrangement that I've been, able, I've been made to understand, the next governor should come from Edo Central. However, uh, Philip Shaibu is also from Edo North, the same place where um, uh, Adam Soshomala is from. So, based on the zoning rhetoric that they follow, he shouldn't have even contested. He should have known that this is what plays. Um, he's complained that um, he's his right to franchise has been taken away from him, his right to contest for governorship elections. But then under the comments, you'll see people saying things like, during his time, zoning came to play and he was put in office. And now he's refusing to let the same zoning come to play and he's trying to contest for the same office. So it's, um, you know, depending on the, the, the side of the divide you stand, uh, it's funny from, from each, each side and the way you look at it. Yes, he has the right to contest, but based on the ar arrangement or agreement or the zoning pattern that they have, um, he probably shouldn't have contested. Again, we're looking to see how this plays out. He said he'll let um, the law of the land come to play. Uh, we'll see what to see if he's going to take it to court. Uh, we'll see what exactly would unfold between now and the end of the term. Bearing in mind that this tenure has about five or six months to go before the elections. All right. Uh, Bernard, so um, with what you've said so far, so good, it seems like um, there's no pity for the former deputy governor looking at what um, the uh, the people are saying, but can you quickly tell us as well? Uh, you're on the streets now. You're you're there in a do state. Um, is there any form of remorse from the people? Are they are they feeling remorseful, especially for the former deputy governor? And is there any form of celebration for the appointment of the new deputy governor? Uh, well. Um I do like people in Benin City are going about their daily businesses. Of course, it's, it's toned down a bit today because it's a public holiday. We're standing outside um, the State House of Assembly. The gates are locked. and I, they, If I told there would be any activity here, it would be skeletal, so to speak. Um, there's no celebration, so to speak. Uh, people are just doing what they're doing. But for those I've been able to speak to, I know that directly I spoke to two people. One person who walked past me this morning while we were setting up uh, for this live shoot. And um, he, he, he clearly rose his voice uh, saying, oh, I want to speak about what's going on in Edo State. And the deputy governor should not have come out, um, you know, to, to run uh, or to say that he wanted to take the position. Some people, he even used the word greed, said he felt that the deputy governor is greedy. I also spoke to another gentleman this morning who's moved us around a, a little bit. We had a little chit chat. And he said the same thing again. But first of all, he said he felt that, you know, that the deputy governor should have been allowed to run his full tenure, which will end in about five or six months. But then again, he also used the term greed. That it appears that the deputy governor may have been a bit um, greedy, based on the words that, you know, that he, that he used, saying... Um, as I mentioned earlier, he knew the arrangement pattern uh, when it comes to picking, um, you know, positions for governorship or deputy governorship in a dual state. Uh, so he should have just stepped back and allowed that same pattern to run rather than coming forward to contest or to show his interest in contesting for um, governorship elections. And as a matter of fact, he also, the, the gentleman I spoke to also said that um, the whole drama that we're seeing here is unnecessary. He feels bad for the deputy governor, but I feel that deputy governor could have avoided all of this drama. Um, again, he used the word greed, saying the deputy governor was greedy. Eight years or almost eight years was enough for him to run his tenure and enjoy the period while he was working with his principal. But the fact that he came out and tried to contest, um, you know, showed a, a bit of disloyalty and that's what has gotten him to where he is. That's based on, on the conversations I had this morning. All right.
Thank you so much, Bernard Akede, and I'm sure that during the course of uh, the news bulletin, uh, we will be able to get back to you for more information and report on what's happening in Edo State. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Okay, so um, we did talk about uh, Julius Aburi as well, Labour Party um, issues taking place in uh, different parts of the country, most importantly in Abuja as well, where you have uh, some of the pro Abure protesters who have gone uh, their way to ensure that they support the embattled, um, uh, you know, Julius Aburi himself. But take a listen to how they decided to do this. I'm sure you're shocked, right? Yes. And so are a lot of Nigerians, especially if you go online, you see the obedience, wondering what is really going on. Well, our guests will be joining us uh, tomorrow uh, due to some uh, situation beyond control. We'd we'll like to have him discuss most especially about uh, what took place and what you just saw and why Julius Abure himself seems not to uh, vacate uh, that particular office. We'll talk about all of these and much more, but let's also tell you that if you are one of the many Nigerians celebrating the Idel Fitri holiday that started today and will end tomorrow, well, here is another update because the Minister of Interior, of course, tweeted uh, on his account, that's X, that the holiday will be extended up until Thursday, April 11. We said it here yesterday morning that a lot of Nigerians, a cross-section of Nigerians, uh, went on the social media space and expressed the satisfaction with the fact that the holidays were to take place on Tuesday or was to uh, be on Tuesday and Wednesday. But now uh, it's actually been moved uh, to Thursday as well. That's the press statement. The federal government has approved Thursday, 11th of April 2024, as an additional public holiday to celebrate uh, this year's Eid El Fitri. And you do have the signature right there. So um, three days of holiday, three days of holiday in. Olive, I wonder what you would be doing. In the words of famous poet, philosopher, theologian, okay, no, not theologian, in the words of... Just for a response. Uh, yes. I just asked a simple question. That what will I do with it? Which one is... No, you what? asked, no, Joe, okay, you asked so me a last. question. Oh, okay, no, I'm no, sorry. No. That what will I do... My bad, my in bad. ...in the next three days during this holiday? And I said in the words of famous philosopher, mm -hmm and the thinker, mm -hmm. the person of uh, Rihanna, she said, work, 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 work. And that's what I'll be doing as I come here every day on your TV screen from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. West African time. So make it a date. Join us on TV, join us on YouTube and all our social media platforms at New Central TV. You see, I told you this dry joke thing is for me. Leave on, leave on for me. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Olive Emody and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.